A brilliant and beloved young woman. A tumultuous relationship. A death that seemed to defy explanation. Her devoted family fought for answers, but even with an official report, questions remain. This week's episode is The Mysterious Death of Phoebe Hanshuk, Part 1. Up, bump in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. This is one we've been asked to cover for years now, and we gave our patrons in the Getting Into It tier this one and two other pretty big cases to choose from and they chose this one so yeah we are gonna do two parts because there's a lot to cover in this one and it's a it's one that i have followed for years too just because it's so um bizarre upsetting a lot of opinions a lot of similarities to some other cases we've covered specifically i think of ellen greenberg when I think of this case, it's uh Heather's has a look like watch what you say because not at all. <laughs> uh, what we've also learned is the laws in Australia are different than the United States, so we Got have to be research. extra careful in how we talk about some stuff. Yeah, I mean, just unrelated to anything, I learned so much about Australian defamation laws and about honest opinion standards versus uh, and also implying or imputing that someone did something criminal. Uh, And I noticed this because of doing a lot of research on this. We're listening to reading, watching tons of material. And I just noticed all these broadcasters would say, Aunt Hample has been cleared of any involvement and we are not suggesting otherwise repeatedly. Mm -hmm. So I would like to say for our purposes, Anne Hample has been cleared from any involvement and we are not suggesting otherwise. There'll also be a disclaimer at the end. We also are going to give our honest opinion based on facts that we have out in public. But I'll say again for clarification, (laughs) Anne Hample has been cleared from any involvement from official sources and we are not implying otherwise. We're going to hear about how the coroner's court works, how hard it is to get a lawyer if people that you are involved are connected well connected societally but that'll all come in part two for now we're just going to set out all of the facts and like christy said there is a significant amount of them and a great source for this has been sadly her family itself and it's Mm -hmm. really really sad much like with the ellen greenberg case where you see parents prevented from really truly and and grandparents in this Mm -hmm. case from truly being able to grieve the loss of a family member because they have to go in and say, I need to get a copy of every shred of evidence that you have. I need copies of police reports, autopsies, and I'm going to have to comb through this because you're not giving my child's case the attention it deserves. And of all people, I mean, we'll hear how her parents were equipped to do you know not not equipped to do this but man they are just emotionally strong people yeah. and they should not have to be no, and god I'm, bless them no parent should have to take on the task of looking at autopsy photos and coroner reports and crime scene photos of their their slain daughter to try and piece together what happened or prove to other people that hey this you didn't get it right we need to open this case back up That is not something any family should have to do if the justice system works the way it should. However, we've seen time and time again that that's not the case. And it just speaks to the love of parents and grandparents when you lose, you know, your daughter or granddaughter in such a horrific way. How do you ever live another day without fighting for this and trying to figure out what happened they have their theories of what happened but it are trying to convince others that this needs to be looked at again because these things aren't adding up i mean it becomes your mission in life yeah you can't blame them and they said they have a website set up and have said you know any attention you can bring to it please bring attention to it and we'll get into as far as in part two you know what you can do as a listener you know make 
uh, write letters or ask for changes and what type of changes I think kind of led to this. But for now, I think step one is what we're going to do in this part one is lay everything out and give equip all of you with the information you need to make your own decision. And then part two, we'll have more action items. Yeah. And Phoebe's Fall is also a really great podcast that uh, is a deep dive into the case as well. I think it's about eight episodes. They're shorter, so it's, it's six episodes. Six. Yeah, it's six episodes, and they've done a couple of like updates mm-hmm. here and there. It's done by two reporters from the Sydney Morning Herald's newspaper, The Age, and so they were actually the very first reporters that Natalie, Phoebe's mom, reached out to and said, you might want to look into this. And the reporter said, as soon as she sent it to me, once I started seeing how things didn't add up, I wanted to look more into the case. And they're actually the first reporters that broke the case. And then from there, later pieces of evidence, he said, this is what made me want to make a podcast about it. So very similar, like Chris Lambert, mm-hmm. where you're, except for their, these are professional journalists, but still where you say, if you, you see something in your community and go, hey, wait a minute, there's more beyond the surface mm-hmm. than this. Yeah, and then, once you start to pick at that thread, it just all starts to unravel. And it's hard to keep up with the twists and turns because it's especially when um, people are involved that have a lot of power. In any case, when people are involved or are related to people that have a lot of power in the mm-hmm. in the criminal justice system, it can be hard to go up against that. No, for sure. Yeah. Anytime you hear, boy, we really couldn't get a lawyer because every single one told us they were conflicted out because of this. And you're like, that is crushing. Mm -hmm. And but then it shows you just how how badly power can interfere in situations like this. And boy, God bless the hand jocks for keeping without that power, keeping the fight up. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you to everybody that voted on this topic. We hope to do it justice in these two episodes. I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. Phoebe Hanscheck was born May 9, 1986, in Melbourne, Australia, to Natalie, a veterinary nurse, and Lynn, a psychiatrist. Phoebe was the first of three children and the couple's only daughter. She grew up close to her parents and two brothers, Tom and Nikolai, as well as her grandmother, Natalie's mom, Jeanette Campbell. Her grandfather, Lauren Campbell, was a retired police detective with 28 years' experience on the force. I really related to Phoebe having a close relationship to her grandma and she called her her confidant uh-huh. and then she told her everything. And I remember being, I mean, my mama died when I was 16, but be you, it's nice to know somebody that has experience, who loves you and doesn't really know a ton of players involved. So you can kind of tell them everything mm-hmm. and they'll give you good advice good and feedback. They had strong, and yeah, non-judgmental as well. The, um, I believe it's the... Australian version of 60 Minutes. Uh, We've linked in the Mm -hmm. show notes. I can't remember the name of it. But Phoebe's grandfather, Lorne, is on a panel of other experts, forensic experts and uh, detectives and stuff. And what a conflicting spot to be in because you're looking at this through the lens of a police detective with 28 years experience. This is also your granddaughter. So... You're having to look at stuff and think about stuff that you would never want to think has to do with your loved one. At the same time, you can look at this pretty much from the jump and say, oh, this investigation was real botched. Oh, very much. It's called Under Investigation with Liz Hayes. That's it, yes. And it has uh, Roland Legg is also on there, and he's a pathologist that you'll hear from from us, and then also in Phoebe's Fall, and in several other, I mean, he's he's been very willing to share his opinion on how badly it's botched, and so that just goes to show as well, Lauren Campbell's opinion as a detective and her grandfather jives also with a man who's unrelated to the case, mm-hmm. but just is also an expert. For sure. Phoebe's family described her to reporters from the age as a beautiful, intense person who had a knack for creativity, including art and poetry, and who would capture the attention of anyone when she walked in a room. Mom Natalie told reporter Liz Hayes. From the beginning, Phoebe was a live wire, you could say. Natalie recalled to the show Under Investigation that Phoebe was a happy little baby and an old soul. The hands-shut children had a charmed upbringing, The close-knit family lived in a beautiful home with a garden and lots of trees to climb. According to PhoebeHandschuck.com, in her younger days, Phoebe was extremely sensitive, caring, and compassionate. She was artistically gifted and creative. Strong-willed and often quick-tempered, she had a cheeky, playful sense of humor. 
She sounds like a lovely girl. She's beautiful. She seems she even in pictures, much like Ellen Greenberg, you just she has this light about her, mm-hmm. you know, this glow that you can just sense that she was a very warm, um, affectionate, tender hearted person. Yeah. And there's videos of her reading uh, poetry mm-hmm. at her other grandmother's funeral. And she's a gifted poet very. and extremely uh, very feeling really well. She could describe her feelings very well. And there's other poetry of hers that's also you know, been released since her passing. And she just you could just tell that she saw the world in a different mm-hmm. way. You know what I mean? Like like how a poet sees it. I was like, I would never have even. Th- I mean, it's she's great. A beautiful yeah. mind, a very like. Mm-hmm. Uh, poetic mind where you see, yeah, beauty and things that most people wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Phoebe was also a prolific artist. She kept journals with intricate and beautiful drawings. She also played guitar and wrote poetry. According to the family's website, Phoebe was athletic, a fast runner, and a basketball player. A few years later, Phoebe became interested in combat training and began kickboxing and karate lessons. She trained at the Melbourne Fight Club with world class boxer Sarah Howard. Sometimes Phoebe would put in eight-hour days training and was passionate about the art form. So we're establishing that in addition to her being a very creative mind, she's also athletic, Mm -hmm. which will come into play later. Yes. A popular girl, Phoebe loved her friends and loved socializing. However, when she was in her mid-teens, Phoebe's parents divorced, causing her to sink into a depression. At age 13... Phoebe and her friends started going out drinking using fake IDs. Phoebe would manage to get drugs from men they met at the bars. That's what a friend of her says. We would go out and guys would buy us drinks and then she would go off and come back and show us like, hey, look what I got. And we're like, where'd you get that? And she's like, that guy just gave Mm -hmm. it to me and just kind of figured out how to work the nightlife like pretty early on. Yeah, there was a lot of cocaine, ecstasy, LSD. And her grandmother said, you know, Phoebe was open with her about this stuff, and she told reporters, I kind of told her, like, you're already a very emotional and sensitive person, and I'm worried from my own experience with LSD and how it affected me that you're this isn't a good combo for you. Not to mention, at 13, your brain is still developing and everything, but when you're going through it and 13 is such an impressionable age, especially for a divorce to happen— I I get it. I was also partying uh, at 13, so no judgment here. Yeah, I mean, you can see how if you're 13, 14, 15 and going through the depression, you maybe eventually she was medicated on antidepressants. Mm-hmm. But before that, if you don't, you know, if you're just trying to figure out how you feel, that's a completely understandable, although not healthy, we know. But when you're 13, you're just like, I don't want to feel sad anymore. And this pill makes me not. Right. Yeah, it makes me not feel that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Initially, Phoebe took her parents' divorce quite hard. For years, she and her father, Lynn, didn't speak much. Eventually, the two talked and began to rebuild their relationship. During year 10 in school, Phoebe began dating a teacher who was 30 years old. Phoebe was 16. Her mother told reporters from the age that she was concerned. It did concern me because the ramifications were huge. Nevertheless, the teacher transferred schools and moved into Natalie's home, where he lived with Phoebe. Despite the illegality and the age gap, Natalie told reporters from the age that it was a genuine relationship. Her friend said the same thing, that it seemed like even though he was a grown up and she was only 16, that they truly cared about each other. They stayed together for a couple years. It's still concerning. And I don't know in Australia if that's illegal. It is in the United States. Is it in Australia as well? Yes. Yes. Heather shaking her head. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a huge age gap. We're going to see a pattern that Phoebe became enamored with older men. Yes. And this is something that her mom has come out and said, too, that she used the word obsessed, that she would almost become yes. obsessed with these older men and kind of like her whole identity would become lost because it would be wrapped up in them. And when you've got a 14-year age gap and the power dynamic of – This was my teacher, so there's already a power imbalance there on top of the age. It's not the healthiest relationship a 16-year-old can have, especially if you're already having some problems and you're on medication and, and partying and stuff. But 
if you can't stop it and you want to have some control over it, I suppose the way one way to do that would be to have him under the same roof. So at least you can kind of see what's going on. Like monitor it. Natalie said uh, she was open about she had a relationship when she was in her teenage years similar and that Len, Natalie's father, and she have a large age gap. So Mm. she didn't really pass a ton of judgment, especially given you're like, you know, I can't tell you what to do because I did the same thing. And she was so Natalie was 24 when she had Phoebe and then Phoebe was 24 whenever she passed away. So Natalie Mm -hmm. talks about she sees this sort of mirroring of her own life and her own struggles in her daughter. And I'm sure, like you said, if she's thinking, well, I remember when I was that age and I was not going to listen to reason. So maybe the only, like you said, the only thing I can do to keep her safe is to keep her Mm -hmm. here. And that way, you know, that's just my sort of conjecture based on her openness and her own experiences and relationships, Mm -hmm. which is definitely, you know, admirable when you say, listen, this is why I did what I did. At age 16, Phoebe began taking antidepressants, a decision that concerned her parents. Natalie told the age. She used to go on and off of them herself, which is very dangerous. Friends her age were also struggling with mental health issues, though, so Phoebe's diagnosis wasn't unusual. Given Lynn's career as a psychiatrist, he had no concerns about Phoebe's mental state since she was getting treatment for her issues. I've been on antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications since oh gosh I don't I can't think of when I was not at this at this time but it is very dangerous to go on and off of them yourself it's also makes you feel like shit I told Mm. you just the other day I had been out of my Lexapro for three days before I could get it refilled and about that Second to third day is when you really start going into withdrawals. And I was a hot mess. I told you, I was yeah. just like crying uncontrollably. Like it fucks with your whole brain and your body and everything. And when you're 16 and you've already got, it's already a difficult age to be having that up and down in your brain chemistry and stuff on top of everything else, it is very dangerous. And also you just feel awful. Your brain is foggy. Your body is gross. Like everything just is is harder to do. Oh, for sure. And I think medicines, anything like that, especially it's altering brain chemistry, a quick hard off Mm -hmm. is there's going to be an impact. And if it was off and on and off and on, you know, if it was multiple times, like you said, that sounds like kind of can become cyclical. Yeah. And it also is ineffective if you're going Mm. on and off of them because it can't stabilize your your brain and it doesn't get in your system enough to where it's like you know a constant stream it's just like doses here and there which aren't going to level you out i was on paxil when i was like 24 probably around her age and i did try and stop it just like cold turkey oh my god that was one of the most unhinged i've ever felt in my life. I believe my mom said I called her in hysterics because the light switches in my apartment weren't the right height, in my opinion. I mean, that's like, you know what I mean? Like, it's something like, you're like, what? But like, to me, that was a straw that broke the camel's back. And I was like flipping Mm -hmm. out about it because you don't feel like yourself. You feel like, quote, you're taking crazy pills. Like, you're just, you know, you can't function. It's just... Unless you've gone through those kind of withdrawals, it's really hard to put it into words, like how you feel like you're not even yourself, like you're, you're, uh, it's like you're a body snatcher, like you're in somebody else's skin. It's terrible. Yeah. No, it sounds like something that's hard to handle as a grown up, much less Mm -hmm. if you're in your teens and early 20s. Yeah. In mid-2009, when Phoebe was 23 and working as a receptionist at a high-end hair salon, she met Aunt Hample. A graduate of the exclusive Wellesley College, Ant was 39 at the time and working as an event promoter, working with names like ACDC, Prince, Michael Jackson, and Riverdance, according to The Age. He was wealthy and well-connected. His father, George Hample, was a former Supreme Court judge, while his stepmother, Felicity Hample, was a sitting county court judge. The two began dating, and in just a few months in early 2010, Phoebe moved into Ant's apartment the posh Balencia building on St. Kilda Road in Melbourne. Phoebe's family weren't opposed to her dating the much older man, but did have their doubts about the relationship, with Natalie telling reporter Liz Hayes. 
because of the differences in the way that they were, I felt as though it wasn't a relationship that was going to last very long. Phoebe's mother noted that there was no signs of her daughter in Aunt's apartment, save for a few photos of the couple together. Although they lived together as partners, Phoebe also paid Aunt rent from her part-time job at a marketing firm, at Aunt's insistence. Most of her possessions were in storage downstairs, according to the age. Phoebe told her family Aunt didn't like her things around. Her grandmother described it as a controlled atmosphere. And that's what the the uh, cleaning person, Shelly, described it similarly. She said everything is marble, glass, metal, sharp edges, very sh- like modern, planned, lush, modern, slick. very, yeah, like upscale. And Natalie said that Phoebe was a lot more bo- bohemian, mm-hmm. boho, like she liked, uh, you know, photos of people that she loved and her family and her friends and, you know, wanted to keep notes more here. More cozy her type of stuff. Way more cozy, Mm -hmm. and Aunt was way more, according to the people that saw the inside of the apartment, very strict, very severe if things were not in their place. But you could imagine as a parent, if you move in and you're like, is this an Airbnb? Where's all your shit at? Do you even live here? And there's a couple of pictures of them together, but it's like, you would know. But he could have that without her living there, too. Right? And it's like, well, where's all your stuff? It's in boxes downstairs. And if I lived with a boyfriend and... None of my stuff was allowed. It would be really hard for me to feel like this was really my space, that when I came home, I was coming home to my home and not my boyfriend's home that I was just staying at for an indefinite amount of time. You know, it wouldn't it wouldn't really feel like yours, like you were it was a place that you maybe felt welcome. Yeah, and you're right. And there was also some discussion of having a a place for everything. And I get people wanting to be organized, but almost to the point of don't move that. That's where that goes. This is my apartment and it goes there and don't move it. Very controlling and some controlled atmosphere. Exactly what Jeanette said. And it's hard to relax if you are not that type of person and then you live in that type of environment. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to relax. Friends also said Phoebe changed herself for the relationship. She lost touch with her old friend group and replaced them with Aunt's friends. She also cut her hair short and dyed it black, matching the same look as Aunt's older sister, Christina, also known as Chrissy. She began dressing like Chrissy as well. Jeanette, Phoebe's grandmother, told the age that Phoebe had shown her extremely expensive garments that she had borrowed from Chrissy. That's what Jeanette said. Where did you get these? And she's like, they're they're Chrissy. She loaned them to me. And Jeanette was just like, they're, this is like multi hundreds of dollars of outfits, like designer, mm-hmm. expensive stuff. And Phoebe's like, yeah, they, you know, she lent it to me. Her friends, she had two phones. She had a Nokia phone that had her old contacts in it from her old life. Aunt gave her a new iPhone. So she had this old phone that had, it's kind of like the separation of your two lives, yeah. right? All your old phone numbers, your old friends, and you keep that locked in a box somewhere. And then- here, this is the shiny new life that you have. Yeah. Again, controlling to be given a phone that, you know, you're, I have a phone. Is this phone mm-hmm. not good enough? Why do I need this new phone? For for all intents and purposes, Christina seems like a very nice person who her and, um, her and Phoebe were very close. Yeah. Like a lot of times you don't see a close relationship between the girlfriend and the, you know, the sibling of the the person that they're with. But they really, like, liked each other and were very friendly with each other. The um, They obviously come from money, the Hamples. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I mean, they had a different upbringing and a different lifestyle than Phoebe did. And when you're kind of brought into that world and you're not used to that, It can be overwhelming and, you know, maybe you feel uh, a little out of your depth, like, I don't know how to behave. I don't know how to act. Do I have the right clothes? Oh, I I need a different phone. My phone's not good enough. That's It's a lot to have that. And also, man, my stuff also isn't good enough to even be in this apartment that I live in that I pay to live in. It's not like he's paying for the whole thing. She's paying Mm -hmm. him. But none of her shit's allowed in there. Yeah. And you're right. And the idea of I don't know how I fit in here. Maybe I should get a haircut that looks Mm -hmm. like Chrissy because they like her. They accept her. And maybe if I mimic her outfits, her hair and your she made comments. Phoebe made comments to friends that were later quoted in, you know, official 
governmental records that said, I'm trash, I'm garbage, I'm not good enough. Um, I just feel like nothing I can ever, nothing I can do is ever good enough for him. So there was this feeling of inadequacy, which makes sense. If you're only 23, you only work three days a week as a receptionist. She eventually left the job at the hair salon and became a receptionist at a marketing firm that aunt's friend managed, like owned. So it's like your boyfriend got you your job. Your job's only part time. It was only a couple days a week. She was struggling with mental health issues. So maybe didn't come that often. So like your income is lower. You're much less well established. He was like I said, he's like out and about with society. You yeah, know, people he in was society. In the, he was in the elite of, of society. For sure. It also puts you in a position where you're dependent on this person financially, uh, emotionally. You know, Mm -hmm. you have kind of abandoned your old friend group. So your social life is dependent on this person, too. It really is, like they said, she kind of lost her own identity and it became wrapped up in whatever guy she was with. She kind of adapted to that identity. Yes, Even though Phoebe was ingratiated with aunt, sister, and friend group, things were rocky. According to multiple sources, Phoebe and aunt had split up four times over the six weeks leading up to her death. Aunt's friend of over 20 years, Vanessa Levin, told court officials Phoebe complained of aunt being quite controlling. In order to clear her head for a while, in October of 2010, Phoebe went to Malakuta, a coastal tourist town where her grandmother lived. Phoebe stayed for a few days with her grandma, Jeanette, who was also her closest confidant. Yeah, you can imagine if you're 23, 24, and you're starting to feel like this person is controlling parts of your life. I speak from experience. When I was 23, I dated someone that was 36. And when someone's that much older, they do, despite, you know, in my head, I'm like, 23 is a grown adult. Mm-hmm. And now I think now I'm like, I didn't know shit back mm-hmm. then. And I had, he was and like. Imagine, and you're 36 right now. Yes. So imagine yeah, dating your 23-year-old self. Right. First of all, hot. <laughs> I but, mean, no, I'm good kidding. for you. But honestly, like I didn't. And and I thank God I had the little bit of oomph behind me to go. This is not the life I wanted. And we did not live together. I was mm. not financially dependent. In fact, we lived in different cities, which made things a lot easier mm. as far as breaking it off. But I do recall. Oh, kid. Oh, kiddo. Oof. Oh, little kid. Mm-mm. Kiddo. And also, oh, you're not behaving properly. Uh-uh. Why aren't you behaving right? No, Almost these- sir fatherish things and I was like I have a dad like I'm good and then when you graduate school you will do this Mm -mm. and I was like nope I'm doing this well no I don't think so the better plan is because I know because I'm older Mm -mm. that when you graduate you will do this and so reading this I was like I can't impute all of that to her but I definitely can relate to having an older relationship when you're that age and some you want to figure out a way out yeah and breaking up Four times over six weeks, that's once every other week, plus yeah. plus a little bit. You know, I mean, yeah. that's exhausting. It's very mm-hmm. unhealthy in any relationship. I mean, and from what I've read, she was the one initiating the breakups each time. And then Aunt would, you know, draw her back in in whatever way. And from my time spent in college studying domestic violence and working at domestic violence shelters, a common thing with women in abusive relationships is they will leave. And then it's just, you know, that cycle of they, they get sucked back in and come back. And the statistics are like women leave seven times before they finally leave, leave for good. Because imagine all the shit that's hard to do when you break up with anybody non Mm -hmm. non non-abusive relationship now you're in an abusive relationship and you got all that stuff tacked on top of the other stuff so it's very hard to do especially if you feel like you're financially dependent on somebody you know but she was trying trying to leave and had finally decided to leave yeah but unfortunately it was too late and i don't think you're out of line to bring up patterns of domestic violence situations because Several friends that either talk to City Morning Herald in the age or talk to officials, the government in the coroner's inquest reported Phoebe text me and said, we got into a screaming match. He was screaming in my face. Mm-hmm. This and this happened. So it's there were documented instances. And I believe Len, her father, said Phoebe marrying him would would have been like walking into a straitjacket. Mm. 
During the visit with her grandmother, Jeanette recalled later that Phoebe decided to end things with Aunt. She was worried he would propose on their planned trip to Paris in December. She didn't want to marry him and didn't even want to return to Melbourne. Instead, Phoebe wanted to stay with her grandmother in Malacuta. She lined up a summer job at the yacht club there so she could return and live with her grandmother. Jeanette told Phoebe to go back to Melbourne and break up with Aunt in person. Sadly, it was advice she would come to regret. And Jeanette even said, I told her, you've ended things badly before. All you have to do is just, you know, a clean cut, have it be over with, and then get your things and you can come back and stay with me. I don't, you can stay as long as you want. And it's definitely something that she struggles with. Oh man, how do you, yeah. And that, of course, of course, anybody would struggle with that. And it's easy for an outsider to say, don't blame yourself. But when you are that person, it's, it's really hard to to get past that. And like my therapist would say, it's okay to to exist in that for a moment, but you can't live there. You can't live in that, well, if I only hadn't said that, because that's just bargaining and denial. And you yeah. have to move past that in order to heal. It's very, very hard to do that, though. Yeah. And then, when you know, how everything comes out, say, this choice was not the reason that right, she passed. Right, right, Like, no. this, you know, it was a, a choice in a series of choices, but there's no one defining, except for the act itself, mm-hmm. there's no one defining thing that you can go, well, oh, man, if, if when she was 13, I could have done this, mm-hmm. or when she was 16, or when she was 20, it's, no. It's I mean, a dangerous it's, game to start playing yeah. the woulda, shoulda, couldas, because you can't go back and change any of that. It's the reality no. of it. So to live in that world where you think you can is... It's just not healthy. You're not living in in reality. Yeah, it's a struggle for sure. Mm -hmm. Sinister Hood will be right back. They say that hair care is the new skin care, but there is one brand that has taken it to the next level. With a devoted following, Kitsch has created game-changing essentials beauty enthusiasts swear by. From satin pillowcases to time-saving towels, Kitsch knows hair care doesn't stop in the shower. Kitsch offers game-changing, time-saving beauty essentials for hair, skin, and body. Whatever your budget, your skin type, your hair type, Kitsch believes you deserve little indulgences at affordable prices morning, noon, and night. Started in 2010 by selling hair ties door-to-door, literally just a hustle and a dream, Kitsch is self-funded, female-founded, and now carried in over 20,000 retail locations. Kitsch's bestsellers include satin pillowcases, which last night Christy and I were at a party and people were getting satin pillowcases. Left and I said, and right. But are they Kitsch satin mm-hmm. pillowcases? So like satin pillowcases, we love them. They're great. But are they Kitsch satin? Turns out they weren't. So also we told turns folks. out they're the hot item of the holiday 2022 season because there were like 10 people of them. were losing their minds every time uh, a satin pillowcase was open. So just saying i have one i sleep on it every night from kitsch it is very good for your skin it's very good for my hair because it eliminates the static and it just my y'all know me and my split my split ends and my flyaways so it's it's very helpful for all those things and it's vegan and cruelty free not like silk made from silkworms they also have ca- caps and eye masks and it's all like christy said so great for your mm-hmm. hair and your skin while you sleep They also offer their famous heatless satin curling rollers. Say bye-bye to heat damage. There are TikTok videos of people literally throwing away their $600 curlers for this. I've used them. It's they, I, I don't understand it. I think it's magic. It, your, the curls stay so much longer than a regular blowout. It's insane. And it's also way faster. You also will love their quick dry hair towels. They work like a dream. They, Heather, you've used them before we even started having them as a sponsor that's how i got them was in 2020 i heard a kitsch i like their uh their hair dry scrunchies mm-hmm. they're terry cloth scrunchies and they also have the quick dry hair towel i use them both and i love them kitsch is offering you 30 percent off your entire order at mykitch.com slash sinister that's right 30 percent off anything and everything at my kitsch spelled m-y-k-i-t-s-c-h dot com slash sinister one more time, mykitch.com slash sinister for 30% of your order. The last time Phoebe's mother saw her was via a Skype call on Sunday, November 28th, 2010. Phoebe was calling from a bedroom in the dark, with her face only lit by the screen. During that call, Natalie asked her daughter if she'd... Patch things up with Aunt? Phoebe replied by holding a single finger up to her lips and changing the subject. 
That's so hard. And she said, oh, well, aunt's in the living room. We were just watching a movie together in the living room. Yeah. And so that's to me, that's saying, please, he can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. You're you could put in um, earbuds or headphones or something, but maybe that wasn't allowed. Maybe she just thought it was whatever. But whatever reason, she did not want to have that conversation where other people could hear it. On Monday morning, Phoebe saw her psychologist. Later that day, she and Aunt went to dinner with a couple that Aunt knew. However, tensions ran high, and the dinner ended earlier than planned. In an interview at the later inquest, the couple's friend Vanessa Levin described the evening as Phoebe had related it to her. According to Levin, as Phoebe was opening up to the other couple at dinner, Aunt shut her down basically and was not allowing her to speak her mind and her truth and open up. So that's got to be embarrassing and really demoralizing. Yeah, it's, it was a, the dinner was at the couple's house. I believe their last name was Rockman, the Rockman's house. And from Vanessa Levin's testimony, they started talking about drinking and struggling with drinking and having issues. And so if she started to try to open up and be like, you know, I do struggle with that. Do you? Have, and it's like, we're not talking about this right now. We need to go. And abruptly ending the dinner. That's so then, embarrassing. It's so embarrassing. And you feel so demoralized mm-hmm. that you try to be connect. You, you're trying to be open and making yeah. a connection with new friends. And it's like, shut up. We're not talking. Yeah, about Yeah. You year. feel like a child that's been chastised at the dinner table. And yeah. It's sent to your room. When they arrived back at the apartment building after dinner, Phoebe and aunt got into a screaming fight in the parking area. She left the building and called a friend, Brendan Hessian. The pair met for a drink at a bar. During that meeting, Phoebe received 27 calls in a one-hour period. All the calls were from Aunt. This made my stomach hurt so bad, as having that same person that was older than me was very abusive and would, because we didn't live in the same city, would call me over and over again or leave voicemails or send messages. And Brendan described to the reporters from Sydney Morning Herald that they're sitting there and her phone was just like and he's like do you need to get that and she's like looked at it no and he's like it would stop and then we're talking about something else and then it's just again and he's like do you need to get that and she looks at it no and that knowing that feeling because on the other side i'd have another drink i'd have 50 more drinks because you know what's happening on the other side of that that you know when you answer it's not gonna be hey babe i was Mm -mm. worried about you thinking about where you are somebody that screamed at you in a parking lot isn't calling you 27 times in an hour to just be like fluffy no. in my experience. And you also know when you go home what is awaiting you, not just on the phone, but in person too. Yeah. And it's not going to be a happy thing. No, no. Outside the bar, angry at Anne's repeated calls, Phoebe threw her phone across the street. She then retrieved it and took the damaged phone with her to her mom's house. And the inquest said that she met with her mom's boyfriend at the time, and he was like, she was really upset, and she was complaining about the relationship and was saying she wanted out. On Tuesday, November 30th, Phoebe left her mom's and returned home after Aunt had left for work. That morning, she made three calls. First, a crisis line, then her primary care doctor, and finally her psychologist, Joanna Young. In inquest interviews, Young described Phoebe as... Really distressed. Phoebe had been meeting with her prior to that date and had confided in Young how she struggled with both alcohol and drug use, as well as her relationship with Aunt, who Young noted in her files was aggressive. In her later inquest interview, Young described her concern that Phoebe transitioned from suicidal ideation to intention. Young clarified, Although she didn't actually say, I'm going to take pills and kill myself, it was sort of inferred rather than stated. Despite this conversation, Young didn't call in any emergency relief for Phoebe. Later that same afternoon on November 30th, around 4 p.m., Jeanette received a text from her granddaughter. Phoebe wrote, I'm okay. I'll call you tomorrow. Kiss, kiss. So, it's interesting, um, concerning, and I got some questions about why Young didn't do more if she was concerned that she had transitioned from suicidal ideation to plans of acting out with it and going through with it. She has said later that she regrets not calling something in sooner, not calling just 
uh, kind of a welfare check with mm-hmm. mental health professionals. But I guess, you know, if by the end of the call, she Phoebe made her psychologist feel like, OK, well, I've, I kind of have everything wrapped up. Now we can hang out or hang up. Everything's OK. Then you might think, OK, well, she sounded fine at the end of the call. But I don't know the exact protocol when you're a mental health professional, what the certain buzzwords are, or buzz phrases are that you need to call somebody in. Phoebe was gone again when Aunt returned home from work. In a private conversation with Natalie's mom, Aunt said Phoebe was out Tuesday night doing ecstasy and spending time with a drug dealer. He couldn't provide any names. Door swipe technology showed Phoebe returning to the apartment building just after midnight. And it seemed like drinking on the at the dinner on Monday night, continuing drinking with the friend, coming home after Aunt was gone, maybe drinking during the day, but at the very least leaving before he gets home, which I know when you're in an abusive mm-hmm. relationship, I wanted to avoid being at oh, home yeah. at all costs. So I relate. And then going out and whatever she was doing, drinking drugs or whatever, but continuing that it's like binging and then a little time to detox and then going back. Yeah. She definitely struggled with alcohol and drugs and her mental health. And that unfortunately is uh, three strikes against you. According to Ant, he took Phoebe's iPhone to a repair shop on his way to work on Wednesday morning. It had been damaged when she threw it outside the bar two nights prior. Strangely, a text was sent from her iPhone at around 1030 that morning. It went to her mother, grandmother, aunt, some other family members, and her boss. It read, Hi, family. I'm in bed about to sleep, and when I wake, I will transform into the most incredible human being you've ever seen. Not. I will go to hospital. It's much safer there, and I hear the special tonight is tomato soup. Delicious, nutritious. I love you all very much, but not enough to send an individual text. Sorry about that. But time is sleep, and I must be on my way. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Later, Aunt said he had not taken her phone to a repair shop that Wednesday, but the next day instead. He returned to the apartment at 12.40 p.m. Wednesday at Jeanette's request to check on Phoebe. He stayed for 10 minutes, according to door swipe records and took his Stillnox prescription of sleeping pills with him when he left. And Stillnox in Australia is called Ambien in America. Yes. So initially, Ant's story was he took Phoebe's iPhone with him on Wednesday to get it fixed. Then later, the story changed, and he said, I actually didn't take it Wednesday, but I took it Thursday instead. Yes. So the and story was, the story changed on his end. Correct. Yeah, there because that was the confusion of then how did this message get sent? And right. he was like, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. It must have been Thursday. Mm-hmm. And that's a unsettling, disturbing message to receive. I mean, it's written in a way where some of it might kind of be her sense of humor or just, you know, she was a very poetic, deep person. And a lot of this is kind of, you know, very uh, flourished writing, very poetic writing. But when you hear, I'm in bed about to sleep, and when I wake, I will transform into the most incredible human being you've ever seen, it is a red flag when you know that they've been struggling with all of this stuff. I wish her psychologist had also gotten the text, because maybe that would have persuaded her to call somebody yeah, maybe put a little bit of pep in the mm-hmm. step. but I, And I believe Aunt took the still knocks with him because she said, I took a couple of these. I'm going to sleep this off. On Thursday morning, December 2nd, Aunt used the gym at 8.13 a.m. and left for work at 9.01 a.m., according to timestamps on the digital key fob that was used. Aunt said that when he left, Phoebe was sleeping peacefully with her dog. Digital records show that around 8.45 a.m., Phoebe got on her computer, sent an email, and browsed the internet. At 11.43 a.m., the building's fire alarm was triggered. Phoebe was seen exiting the building wearing sunglasses and walking her dog. At one point in the footage, she seems to stumble, leaning against a wall in the lobby and losing her balance. Yeah, she's standing kind of, her back is to the wall and she's facing the elevators and then someone walks by her and she kind of moves back toward the wall and kind of like does a couple quick steps. And then leans against the wall. But then she stands back up and then walks straight out the front door. 
But to me, she seems slightly impaired. She's looking around. She's got sunglasses on, but her head is on a swivel. And it's not just like, oh, everybody's rushing out of the building. She just sort of looks dazed. Mm -hmm. Like maybe she had been drinking or there'd been something going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think she was drinking and also had a not an overdose of still knocks, but she had a clinical dose of still knocks mm -hmm. in her system. Mm -hmm. And this is another time, too, where timestamps and stories kind of changed depending on who you're talking to. Some things said that Aunt left for work at 830 and he saw her sleeping and was with her dog. But then the digital technology shows him using his key card, swiping out of the building at 901. So did he stay at the gym and shower there and leave for work from the gym that was maybe in in the same building? It's a little hazy, this, yeah, this timeline. It, that becomes the issue is somebody testifies or gives a statement to police and then by somebody, I mean, Aunt Hampel. <laughs> yeah. And then digital records prove that that and it's like, oh, I might I must have remembered it wrong. Mm -hmm. I'll just want to clarify. Aunt Hampel has been cleared <laughs> by the coroner of any involvement and we are not implying otherwise. I would also like to um, clarify that you can't lie with technology. <laughs> Yeah, that's that becomes the point of like, well, I want the truth to be this. And they're like, OK, cool. Well, it's not. So here's the evidence that yeah. it's not. And it's like computers have this. no agenda. Uh, door swipe cards, electronics, they don't have an agenda. They just are there to pump out data. That's it. There's a single image of Phoebe at 1150 a.m. that shows her returning to the apartment building shortly after that. Digital records showed she used the computer once again at 12.01 p.m. Another fire alarm sounded at 6.05 p.m., though official court records state that it is unknown whether occupants left the building at that time. Do you think it's weird that there are so many fire alarms going off? It is strange. Literal fire alarms. Yeah, it seems strange that they both happened in the same day. And one thing that uh, I heard an expert bring up was that because of the fire alarm, you're not really sure who's going in and yeah, out of the building. It could trigger like a shortage and you don't need a, a card to swipe into stuff anymore because this was the type of building where you could only go in the elevator to the floor that you lived on. Like you're mm -hmm. kind of like in hotels. So if the fire alarm gets triggered and electricity or whatever's out, then that's off the table and people could come and go. It would be great if the police had captured the CCTV footage from outside the apartment building during this time. And then Spoiler we could alert. just know if people were coming and going. That would have been really helpful. It would also be great if we could see all of the footage that was captured and that someone's family didn't have a permanent gag order on that footage. Mm. Someone's Aunt Hample, his family, has a gag order on it. He has been cleared of all and wrongdoing. We are not implying otherwise. I'm not implying otherwise, but... I'm just telling you a fact that his family's lawyers suppressed evidence. Yeah. I'm just telling you that That's, fact. Look it up. We're, we're not making that up. Nah. Ant swiped his key card to get into the apartment building four minutes later at 6.09 p.m. He and Phoebe were supposed to go to dinner with her father, Lynn, that night at a Thai restaurant to celebrate Lynn's birthday. According to Ant in a recorded conversation with Phoebe's mom, he walked into an empty apartment. He found fresh blood on the computer keyboard, a ripped couch cushion, and broken glass on the kitchen floor. Phoebe's entire purse, with its contents intact, were on the kitchen counter. Her computer was open to her Gmail account. Her hair straightener was also on. There were candles lit. Candles were lit, and her phone charger was in her purse. So it appears... Uh, you walk into a scene that looks like someone just stepped out for a moment. Somebody was in the middle of something and were, were interrupted in what they were doing. It wasn't a scene like, I am leaving this house and locking up. You don't leave shit plugged in that could burn your apartment down and candles and stuff on. Yeah. If I walked into my home and no one was here and I saw broken glass and blood... I would be very panicked. Yes. I would maybe call the police. I'd probably or start calling call first who, Tommy. And then yeah. if I can't get in touch with anybody, the police very quickly. Yeah. 
Yeah. And also it is uh, important to note that the sunset this day was at 8.35 p.m. So it's still sunny out at 6 p.m. when they get home and sh- her sunglasses were missing. Yes. Despite the disturbing scene, Ant did not call police. He smoked a cigarette and drank a beer. Then he made some calls, according to reporters from The Age. First, he called a colleague. Then he called his and Phoebe's friend, Vanessa Levin. After that, he began looking through Phoebe's computer between 6.19 and 6.34 p.m. So, none of those were still the police. Correct. No, they were not. At 6.51 p.m., Lynn called his daughter to let her know he was running late. After several rings, it went to her voicemail. However, strangely, Lynn's phone rang seconds later. It was Ant. Timestamps show him calling Lynn at 6.52 p.m., the first time Ant had ever called him since he began dating Phoebe. Lynn told reporters from The Age. He had never before in the 14, 18 months altogether called me. And why would he call me? During their later testimony, Lynn and Ant described their conversation, saying the disgust that Phoebe was not home. During the three-and-a-half-minute call, Ant did not mention the blood, broken glass, or ripped couch cushion. Yeah, this is where it gets kind of weird. Ant says it was a twist of fate. Just so happened that five seconds after Lynn's call rang on Phoebe's phone and went to voicemail, that Ant decided to pick up the call, his phone and call Lynn back. He's like, her phone was at the repair shop. I swear it was at the repair shop. Somehow, though, he knew that Lynn had just called and seconds later, Aunt called him back mm. and said her he didn't know that Lynn had called because her phone's at the repair shop. That is interesting. So there's that. And then, yeah, Lynn's like, oh, hey, t- sorry, I was calling to say I'm going to be late. Where are y'all? Oh, well, I don't know where she is. Yeah. Oh, OK. Well, I guess we can just cancel dinner. OK, well, I guess I'll let you know if I find her. Not shit is fucked up yeah. around here. There's broken glass. There's blood on the keyboard. I'm a little worried. I'm concerned for her safety. Yeah. What yeah. if she was drunk? She cut herself and took off running and God knows what happened. But no. No, none of that was mentioned. And it would be very weird, too, if a year and a half of dating, you never once hear from this person. And then all of a sudden you you hear from him. It, it would be very uh, disarming. Yeah, that today's the day of all. You're mm-hmm. like, why are you calling why me? Why today? And then when you when we all are going to learn what happened, then you really start to think, oh, why today? Yeah. Moments later, around 7 p.m., the building's concierge made a terrible discovery. She called her boss to tell him. There's a body in the compactor room. It was Phoebe. The question was, how did she get there? Aunt Hample has been fully cleared by the coroner of being involved in Phoebe's death, and we are not suggesting otherwise. If you or someone you know are struggling with your mental health, help is available. If you're in the U.S., U.K., or Australia, use any phone to dial 988 and reach the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. So what do we think? So we've laid you out the facts. This is our honest opinion. These are our opinions based on the evidence at hand. Hang on. Hold on. Let me pull up the case law. One second. These are uh, our opinions based on proper material, which is the facts that we explicitly set out previously in this podcast, and also they're notorious facts. So from here on out, it's our honest opinion. What is your honest opinion, Heather? Based on the information I have here right now, I am uh, concerned about a less than caring boyfriend coming home mm-hmm. and not really kicking it into gear. And everybody reacts differently. He arguably knew her better than anybody. But uh, did he? Spoiler- I think no. I would argue the grandmother I think knew so. her better I than think- anybody or her, her own mom. Yeah. Yeah, Natalie. But he spent more time with her, I guess. So he may have thought. But yeah, he's known her for a couple months, truly. I will say, uh, spoiler alert for part two, you guys, he doesn't uh, call 911 right away. Again, after hanging up with Lynn, he calls and orders takeout from the very Thai restaurant they were supposed to go to. So again, another. I had a hankering for that Thai and now they weren't going. So he was going to get it one way or another. 
I distinctly remember initially reading the facts and being like, oh, I, I read that wrong. No, surely that's not what happened. No, How that's exactly what happened. How do you have an appetite given yeah. the situation? And uh, he found out about the body because the fire alarm or when the tie was delivered, the delivery guy said, hey, what's going on? There's like a million cop cars outside your building and so Aunt went downstairs and asked one of the police officers, hey, I live here. What's going on? And they said a body was found in the compactor room. And then he thought, oh, that could be Phoebe. Gave some details of her looks and identifying tattoos. And they were like, that is who we have found. So that's how he found doubt, according Not to him. From- Searching the building, going, yeah. looking, asking if anybody's seen her. He found out from uh, the delivery guy that brought him his dinner. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what I think right now, yeah, what we have so far is, uh, I think, uh, a relationship that uh, was not healthy for either, either mm-hmm. of the parties involved, particularly not for the vulnerable 23-year-old who suffered from substance use issues and mental health issues. I don't think that that was very healthy for her at all to uh, be held to a standard that she probably couldn't, that's probably going to exacerbate, right, any of your issues Mm -hmm. that you have. If you have low self-worth, low self-esteem, and that you are with a person who is much more wealthy than you, much more well-connected, much more powerful than you, lives in a nicer apartment, has fancier friends, has a fancier sister with fancier clothes, you are definitely going to feel like you are not good enough. I wish that she would have known she was perfect just as she was, that her family loved her just as Mm -hmm. she was. But that's what our wish is for everybody who has low self-worth and low self-esteem is that we love you for just who you are. You don't have to be better or cut your hair or change anything about you. So She had been struggling for years since a teen with her mental health. And it sounds like she was self-medicating to numb the pain, numb whatever. And, uh, yeah, it's tragic. I agree. It seems like a very toxic relationship, very unhealthy, very imbalanced I, if I were Phoebe, I would not have felt seen or heard in this relationship. Um, And I, you know, I I get it. I get why people turn to drugs and alcohol when they're in situations like this. Because it's, it's a quick fix to a long-term problem. It's not the right fix, but when you're in so much pain that you just want to forget about it for a little bit. You know, I I can understand why she would be doing that. It's very concerning to me that this dude would walk in and see this situation and just be like, huh, well, how's that pad tie looking? Like, I mean, a ripped couch cushion, blood, and you can see from the police photos, of which there are very few. We will talk in the next episode. This investigation was fucked from the jump. But there is still broken glass all over the floor and there's blood on a door frame and there's blood on her computer. You know, it's not like, oh, a tiny little droplet of blood in the sink from I I pricked my finger. It's, It's more blood than that. Yeah, you would have seen it. And he later on made a comment, which was definitely pointed out as an inconsistency saying, oh, I also found a shrine in the middle of our bed. And there was a shrine with pictures of our cat and with pictures of, which I didn't, I heard about a dog, but a picture of a cat, a pet cat and different post-it notes and everything. And the crime scene photos, although there are a few of them, show that's not the case. That there was not the shrine in the bed. The items he described were in fact on bedside tables or dressers that were to me, it looked like stuff that was actually hers, that he was like, there's just a shrine of garbage in here. Right. But that's okay. If true, let's say it is true that you see a shrine in the middle of the bed and these other things. I'm not like, well, I better light up and crack a cold fosters yeah. while I get ready for the day. Like that is a kick your ass into gear mm-hmm. and go, okay, well, we got to find her because she doesn't have a phone because I've allegedly taken her phone to a repair shop. So, and the Nokia phone is in the wind. We don't know where that one, the original old phone is gone. So she's got no phone, no purse with her. I mean, are you not calling the concierge going, my girlfriend is gone. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to meet. There ain't shit around here. Would you not call her friends? Hey, Vanessa, have you heard Mm -hmm. from her? I know she texts you sometimes. Call your sister, call her old friend she doesn't talk to. Jeanette probably knows, mom, dad, get everybody out looking for her. But this full hour that we have between the door swipe technology confirming that 
Aunt Hampel arrived at the building at 6.09 p.m., five minutes after the fire alarm. It is confirmed that he entered the building at 6.09, and then 7 p.m. is when her body is found. That's it's, just a couple of facts Those for are you just facts? To consider. Those are facts. What I'm going to say next, not a fact, speculation. Is it your honest opinion based upon all of the facts here and the notorious facts in public? It is. Oh, fantastic. Please proceed. <laughs> I think it's it seems too coincidental or too convenient that a fire alarm went off and then four minutes later the door swipe happened i have some thoughts that are my own opinions i have a question about somebody who possibly lived on the seventh floor is your implication then or is your question that it could someone have been in the building, rang the fire alarm. This is a resident on the seventh floor. Mm-hmm. This has nothing to do with anyone that lived on the 12th floor, which is where Phoebe and Ann lived. Are you saying that a resident on another floor could have pulled the fire alarm, utilized the fire alarm to exit the building, and then come back later, five minutes later, and beep themselves in, or 10 or 30 minutes or another day, come back and beep themselves in so that there's a timestamp of when they beep themselves in? That is what I am saying, that a seventh floor resident could have easily done that. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Were that true? Do you think that that would be captured on CCTV footage? And if so, maybe you would put a gag order on that footage? I do think so. What a question. Isn't that funny how that could have all worked out? Yeah. Um... It's just, I'm not one to believe in um, coincidences like that. I think that when you zoom out and you start to think, how could all of this work together? You get a pretty clear cut picture of, of how it could easily work. And really, it is smart, but it's not so smart that you couldn't easily piece it together. Yeah. If no, you I think weren't, you're right. If you were wanting to piece it together. Yes. If you were not from the jump, just pushing a certain narrative. It's very similar to Ellen Greenberg. If you haven't listened to that episode that we did where you just see a certain narrative pushed and mm-hmm. anything that doesn't jive with that narrative gets uh, muffled, pushed by the wayside. And just like with Ellen Greenberg, her fiance's family was very connected politically and uh i believe his uncle was a judge a very well respected judge you know coincidentally and hample's dad is also an ex-supreme court judge and his stepmom is a sitting county judge and it's just a, a fact that judges are well connected politically and know a lot of people in uh you know the police force and other things and And so on and so forth. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, professional courtesy you see where normally, like with uh, Ellen Greenberg's, uh, Sam, her fiance's family was allowed into the crime scene. Yeah. So was Aunt Hample's family and friends. Yeah. It's so strange how you just, because of someone, maybe who they are, they seem very distraught that it's okay with you that they have unfettered access to technology, the crime scene, and all contents of that, what is essentially a crime scene, all, all contents of that room. I will say, too, and uh, Ellen Greenberg's apartment was very nice. I don't know if it was the high-rise level that Aunt Hample's was, but when police walk into a residence and they see uh, a very nice ha- home with nice belongings and the person that lives there is dressed nice— well spoken, known for political connections and and you know wealth, that can cloud how one might look at a crime scene. Or immediately, some things don't even occur to you. Like, oh, this might be a crime scene. No, this is actually a tragic tragic scene of an accident or a suicide or something else. But clearly, this person couldn't be responsible for a crime because look at him. I think you're talking about inherent bias that we all Mm -hmm. have, and especially the bias toward wealth, whiteness, privilege, power, money. And if you're in an industry which is based upon hierarchy, military, police, fire, et cetera, that it is you answer to the commander above you. Really, I mean, who's higher up than a judge? 
a Supreme Court judge at that. Doesn't matter if they're still in power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It just seems like you would uh, treat a case in a very, very fancy apartment complex on this very posh road in this very nice state a little bit different than you would if it was somebody in a, a much uh, much worse off house, you mm-hmm. know, a lot, lot less money, no power, no connections. Uh, and it's interesting to see that nine times out of ten, when a, a partner in a relationship is killed, the suspect, you know, prime suspect is the other partner. Look into him and absolve them if you can, you know, rule them out. But in this case, it's just we're good. We don't no, need to look good. at all. We're good. Not yeah. only that is nine times out of ten, it's the partner and they should be looked at. But there was reason to look at him based on the evidence of concerning text messages, conversations that she had with her psychologist. You know, there was uh, things in writing, in 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 text and in written, handwritten in the psychologist's notebooks and stuff that showed that they had a tumultuous and abusive relationship. It wasn't yeah. like everyone was like, oh, my gosh, they were the happiest couple we've ever seen. We we couldn't imagine something bad happening. They were planning on getting married, blah, blah, blah. It Nobody spoke of them that way. No, it was, uh, it's time to shut it down. It's time to, mm-hmm. it's, I believe Vanessa Levin said, I think it's best you go your separate ways. Like, I don't want... I'm not trying to step in anybody's toes here, but based on what you're telling me, also, to your point, the evidence, the rest of the evidence is on her body. There's bruises that have nothing to do with the manner in which she died, but are, in fact, grip mark bruises. Mm -hmm. So we'll discuss that in part two, though. Yeah, we will. We'll uh, talk about what the police say happened, what um, her family thinks happened, and then what our opinions are and what happened based on the evidence in the second episode. Got a lot of evidence for you. Lots of evidence. A lot of, um, I'm a big fan of not just like saying, okay, well, this seems what could happen, but let's test this theory and And let's reconstruct this trash chute to see how somebody could get inside of this and fall 12 stories. And there's multiple tests have been done that to me when i see something like that i'm like oh well why are we even discussing this anymore yeah and lauren campbell phoebe's grandfather the detective also likes tests so we'll talk about the tests he conducted Mm -hmm. he's done multiple ones over the years shouldn't shock anyone police have done none Mm -hmm. but his are extremely compelling and that along with all the rest of the evidence and uh well like you said we'll get to the various versions of the truth in part two absolutely we love- oh, Anne Hample has been fully cleared by the coroner of being involved in Phoebe's death, and we're not suggesting otherwise. Just one last time. Just one last all. time. Thanks for listening. We love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost. So if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Rolling the Airwaves and Getting Into It tier, a special shout-out on the show, monthly bonus minisode, and Patreon-exclusive video and audio content, including Am I the Asshole, Relationship Advice, Judge Christie, Dear Sinister, True Crime Headlines, and so much more. Patrons in the Getting Into It tier are also able to vote on a bonus content segment each month that they would like to see us live stream. Keep your eyes peeled for the week. It's going to probably be the week of Christmas. We'll put up the vote, and we're going to do our live stream segment on December 29th at 8 p.m. Central. And you also get to vote on a main feed episode, which is what why we're covering the topic we're covering today. Yes, it is. You also have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We hop on occasionally, and we host monthly Q&As on Crowdcast, where you can ask us all your burning questions this month's December 28th at 8 p.m. Central. So we have the... Q&A on the 28th, the live stream on the 29th, it's perfect because you want a little break from Christmas stuff, but then you get a little little pep in your step right before the new year. We'll do a pre-new year party. Mm -hmm. We'll do a countdown and everything. (laughs) Post-year, pre-year. 
For patrons not in the U.S., you have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available. Those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. These are great holiday gifts. People love a subscription, even if it's just a monthly, you know, here, this is for a month. Or you do annual, then you get a free month, which means you're saving. And they have to think about you every time now, every month when we do all this stuff. So you're always on their mind. It's the perfect gift. It is the perfect gift. Somebody asked about how to do a Patreon gift. There's not a really straightforward way. You can sign up for Patreon using your email and then just switch it to theirs later on. Or you can give them a gift card for the amount of the Patreon. Unfortunately, Patreon doesn't let you sign up for someone else, but it does let you sign up and then just put it in their name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. If you want to get some cool swag like T-shirts, including our all-brand-new logo T-shirt that just dropped. It was on a pre-order, but now you can also order it. Um, And you can also get mugs, totes, hoodies, hats, and clothes for your kiddos. Visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Shop on the top banner. Really, you can do all your holiday shopping by just visiting Sinisterhood.com one-stop shop and then if you're like oh i don't know maybe she would also like something else or he would like something else guess what satin pillowcases my daddy slept on a satin pillowcase and nobody in the world had better hair than that man (laughs) except maybe me and that's because i am his daughter and i sleep on a kitsch pillowcase so it's like win-win there you go the best thing you can do to help us grow is like review and follow on apple podcast spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast and please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out You can also share any episode by clicking the three dots in the top right corner and share topic-based playlists from Spotify by visiting Sinisterhood.com slash playlist. All of this means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod, like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood, or follow us on YouTube and TikTok at Sinisterhood Podcast. Where are you at, Christy? I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and Twitter and TikTok at Christy or GTFO. Heather? I am on Twitter at MCK versus the world and on TikTok and Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Belle Sinfield. Christine Konopaski. Katie Finro. Danny Furness. Megan Pulliam, Victoria Laudermilk, Annabelle Middleton, Katie Cardell, Kim Brown, Caitlin Faniza, Jennifer Koenig, Madison D, Mindy, Mary Carol Hicks, Tracy Blankenship, Ksenia Karatanova, Justine Farmer, Angela Johnson, Heather Popke, Stacy B, Morgan Jones, Natasha Lovis, Beth Beth, Alex at Hogwarts, Melissa Cool, Anna Wood. Nicole Zorarian, Paige Avenger, Cassie Phelps, Emily, Krista Godoy, and Bianca. Thank you all so much for supporting the show. We hope we pronounced your names correctly. We could not do this without you. We sincerely, sincerely appreciate all the love and support. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. Wah-ha-ha-ha.